I'm Tiziana Tedesco, Deputy Director of Eco Canada. On behalf of our Chamber and our Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you back to Great Italian Wines. This event is part of the True Italian Taste Project, which is promoted and financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Tonight, I'm happy to confirm that due to the great response we had so far for these classes, we have decided to add two more, which will take place, mark your calendars, on Thursday, June 24th, and on Thursday, September 16th. Also, we will be happy to send all participants the presentations of our sommelier, Sandra Colosimo, as many of you express a desire to keep them as a precious source of information. Sandra is a certified sommelier with the renowned Italian Association of Sommeliers, and she has brought her expertise to Cavinona, Terroni's exclusive wine agency, where she works as sales and marketing manager. But before we let Sandra tell us all about Aglianico and Montepulciano, I would like to remind you of our upcoming events. Starting April 20th and until May 11th, we will bring you four webinars on the region of Friuli, their UNESCO tourist destinations, their regional food and wines. On Tuesday, May 18th, join us for Authentic Italian Table and Buonissimo, an online event with six local Italian restaurants of Toronto and the GTA and their amazing chefs. On May 27, we will have our Eco Canada Business Excellence Awards to recognize outstanding business people in Ontario. And then in June and July, we will bring back our weekly cooking classes to Tia Tavola with Chef Roberto Fracchioni. So keep following us. We look forward to welcoming you all in the upcoming weeks. We also would like to invite you to consider becoming a member of Eco Canada taking advantage of our special offer of $200 for one year. It will be greatly appreciated as your personal contribution to our program of events. You will get more details on this in the chat and in our communication. Now it's time for me to turn the spotlight to Anna Mamoliti of Cavinona uh, to say a few words and to let you know what Cavinona's offer tonight, especially for you. So thank you so much, Cavinona. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you especially to all of you who have connected with us tonight for another interesting class on Southern Italian wines. Grazie and see you at the end of the class. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tiziana, for um, letting us join you this evening. I cannot speak enough uh, to all the amazing work that Eco Canada does to promoting Italian culture, Italian food, and this evening, Italian wine. So on behalf of Cavinona and on behalf of Terroni, it has been, it is a pleasure and an honor to collaborate with Eco Canada and to be a part of True Italian Taste. Um, it's always wonderful to work with like-minded people who share the same philosophy in bringing the best of the best that Italy has to offer um, to the Canadian market and hence to our guests at all of our restaurants, whether it's food or it's wine. So it's always a pleasure. Um, that, this is one of the reasons why we actually formed and started Cavinona um, uh, to bring a uh, Italian wines, uh, and there are so many that Italy has to offer to the Canadian market um, and as our commitment to, to doing this for um, all of our customers. Um, wines that perhaps the LCBO, you know, maybe found a little bit too risky uh, to bring in and wines that we were not able to find here in the market. So um, it's always a, a pleasure to be able to do this for our customers. Um, and with this, of course, there's always a little bit of educating, um, educating our customers and, and hence our staff. Um, so I would like to thank Corrado Paina, Tiziana Tedesco and Astrid Durzo for sharing their passion and commitment to Italy and to everything that Italy has to offer. Tonight we are taking you to Abruzzo and to Basilicata, uh, where my colleague and friend Sandra Colosimo will lead um, this presentation. So we hope you enjoy um, the wines this evening. And if you do, we are happy to offer a discount of 10% uh, through our Cavinona website. Um, I believe uh, the code will be put on the chat this evening um, for you to um, uh, please take and, and use. 
Um, so without further ado, I will pass it on to Sandra. And thank you again. Buonasera a tutti and welcome. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here for the third class of Great Italian Wines. And I'm just really pleased that it's not the last of this series with the additional classes scheduled for June and September. Um, connecting with you all has been wonderful and it's been a great lift and inspiration during these crazy times. But we think of the of propelling forward. And I just want to say that your enthusiasm and energy has been much appreciated. So we're gonna get started. We have some fantastic wines. Um, we may not be grabbing our bags just yet to travel, to travel, but we are grabbing our glasses and we're traveling to the regions of Abruzzo in central Italy and then south to Basilicata, um, where we're exploring the great varieties of Montepulciano and the mighty Alianico. Both these regions are very unique and perhaps um, less known and certainly off the beaten track in terms of tourism. So um, just very, very interesting regions and exceptional wines. And it's definitely worth the journey. So grab your glasses, start sniffing. Perhaps you may want to have a taste or two. Um, I would love to have your comments. Uh, please send them in. Any questions as we go along, tell me what you think. Um, so this evening, I'm very pleased to uh, present two wonderful producers um, and partners of Cavinona. So we have Tori De Biasi with our 2018 uh, Monte di Bocciano, and we have uh, Grifasco with Alianico del Vultere. Um, I know the, the pronunciation, it seems like either Vulture, um, I may make a mistake as well, but it is Vulture. Uh, these are two wineries that represent um, passion, experience, commitment to quality, and truly uh, respect for nature and its territory. Anna just mentioned about our interest and what we specialize in. And it's really seeking out those authentic producers um, where maybe quantities are much smaller to um, go into bigger out, uh, channels of distribution. And so as what we like to say, what I like to say is that these are people that are uh, they run the company, their families, there's passion, there's experience, and they literally get their hands dirty. Um, so I hope you enjoy them. And I just want to say that both these wines, they fully express the spirit of the land. And you will see how the land of both these regions is just really unique and um, interesting. Okay, so we can get started with the presentation. Okay. We can move forward, that's okay. Just as a quick refresher, we have a map of Italy here. So I just wanted to show where um, we're heading down. So central Italy, so we did, um, we did Tuscany um, last month and then you come down to Umbria and on the Adriatic coast. So we're changing coast a little bit. We have um, um, Abruzzo, which it borders with Marche to the north and Molise to the south um, and Lazio. Okay, and then we head down south to Basilicata, which is literally right in the instep of the boot. Okay, so the first thing I would like to clarify, because I do get a lot of questions about this and, there, and it's just easy to, to make some mistakes. Now we're talking about Montepulciano, the variety. So, but there is, as we talked last month, we have Nobile, uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, and that's made from the variety Sangiovese. And there's also the town, of course, of Montepulciano in Tuscany. Um, so just to clarify that, they're two different things. So we're talking about the variety of Montepulciano. Okay. Okay, Montepulciano, um, documentation of the variety dates back to the late 1700s but they believe that it has been around since a uh, time of the etruscans um, possibly could have come from tuscany um but uh but it has been home in 
central Italy for many years, uh, for many centuries. Um, it is the second most widely planted variety in Italy. Um, and it's a high yielding grain. So just to give you a comparison, last month we talked about Tuscany um, and uh, Sangiovese, sorry, was the first um, inter most uh, widely planted grape. And so the Monte Pulciano is second. So as I mentioned, it's predominantly grown in Abruzzo and the other regions include the Marche to the north, Molise, Puglia, and not only. There are many other regions from central to south, uh, but those are the main ones. Um, Monte Pulciano d'Abruzzo Doc, I think many of you are familiar with that because the wine, Monte Pulciano d'Abruzzo Doc, is probably one of the um, most exported DOCs. Um, and it, it was really, really popular. So I one of the first many, many years ago onto the export market. And it is the most famous wine of the variety. Okay, so here's a, a, a map of Abruzzo. And basically, just to give you an overview, uh, there are four provinces. The multiple channel uh, variety is grown in all four uh, provinces or province. So you have Teramo to the north, which produces some explicit uh, multiple channel. There's one DOCG there. L'Aquila um, to the west of the region. Um, and there you get some good um, uh, rosé or rosato. And what's important to know is the Apennines, which we'll be looking at um, for on the west side of Abruzzo is an important factor, which is runs north and south um, on the west side. So you can see, I don't know if you can see the Gran Sasso, and we'll be talking about that. Um, the other province are Chieti to the south and Pescara. Uh, Torre di Biati is in the uh, region of Pescara. Um, so you have some really fine, fine producers, I mean, throughout, but Pescara and Teramo are wonderful, are uh, particularly um, uh, good regions. Um, in the past, there was a little bit of a, of a bad rap over the years in terms of Montepulciano becoming sort of in terms of mass production. Um, however, that and so a lot of the many years ago, a lot of the cooperatives were is south of Kepi in that area, but that culture has changed and it's a whole new world. And the Monte Pulciano um, is a very um, special um, grape, and it's the quality is back, and so that's that's the most important message. Okay, so the next. So as we said, Abruzzo is centrally located on the Eastern coast. So what's most important here is we're gonna look at the landscape. And of course it's beautiful, but there's reasons because we talk about, as we've talked about in the other classes, um, uh, bodies of water, mountains, um, altitude, those things, those things are all very important in terms of the health of the vines that promote uh, vine growing and great wine making. And that's why, as we talked about that Italy is the number one producer of wine and the number one exporter. So these are some of the reasons why we produce such wonderful wines. Okay, so um, you have the Gran Sasso, uh, which is translated into big rock or stone um, on the west. And it's the highest mountain range. A lot of people, maybe some of you are familiar, but a lot of people perhaps not, because again, Abruzzo is not often on the tourist map and I do highly recommend it. Um, because it's the highest mountain range after the Alps. So it's uh, 2,900 meters above sea level. And there's also uh, Mount Maella. And there's, there's a few others, but those are the two highest. It's 2,793. So you have great heights there. Um, and we'll look at what, why that's important in terms of uh, grape growing. Uh, Abruzzo is considered the greenest region of Europe, which I was surprised, but definitely the greenest region of Italy. Um, a lot of national parks, protected reserves, um, almost half of it, which makes up almost half of the territory. So again, this is another important aspect of three national parks. You can see there's plenty of them, and it ensures survival of 75% of Europe's wildlife. It is home to some rare species and um, there have been some international um, programs uh, done on this because um, 
the marsican brown bear, for example, they're down to like 50 or 60 bears. It's sort of, um, it's, 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 it's improving the situation, it's proving the golden eagle. Um, there's this, so it's a very special, special area. Um, it's great for skiing, for hiking. Um, so I do recommend it because it's great for wine. Um, okay, the climate, of course, for south, we know uh, lots of sunshine, beautiful beaches. Um, and so it's warm and dry on the coast and more continental inward. Again, this is a factor in terms, we'll look at that in terms of air circulation and heights and what that means um, for vine growing. Okay. Uh, so here, this is an exact. This is a picture of. Uh, this is actually a picture taken from our producer, Tori De Biasi, and and there you can see uh, it's very close. It's about a thirty-minute drive, so um, you can see just how majestic it is and how close. And and uh, and then there's often snow uh, on the top on the um, peaks uh, throughout the year. Okay. Abruzzo viticulture. Okay, just like in Italy, this is very common. Uh, ancient wine making, making uh, goes back to the sixth century BC, uh, thanks to the Etruscans. Um, it was concentrated in the Pelinia Valley in the province of Aquila, but then um, it spread throughout. It is the fifth most productive wine region by volume. Um, so there you have some stats, 3.5 million hectoliters of wine. So I thought it was certainly like a lot of wine. Um, it, Montipuchana is produced, as I mentioned, in all four uh, province or provinces. Um, L'Aquila is the capital of Abruzzo and 32,000 hectares are cultivated. As a comparison versus 58,000 hectares of Tuscany, why is that important? Because um, Tuscany, uh, we looked at as the sixth most productive wine region. So you can see how in almost half of the hectares, they're producing a lot of wine. Um, over half of these of the vineyards of the hectares is dedicated to the cultivation of multiple channels. So clearly a very important grape. Um, U.S., Canada, and Germany were the leading ex export uh, destinations. So we know we love our wines and we appreciate our wines. Um, okay, next. Characteristics of Montepulciano. Okay, so as you can see, it's a blue, purple, rich, dark color. Um, now it gives a, it has a high concentration of pigments. Okay, so we looked at Nebbiolo, uh, we looked at Sangiovese, which the reverse was true. Um, not uh, high on the on the uh, pigmentation or concentration of what we call anthocyanins, which are the pigments. Um, so. Montepulciano, as you can see from your glass, it's very dark, which is very different than the characteristics of the Nebbiolo and Sangiovese. Um, we looked at the Valpolicella, which was a little bit darker. Um, it is late ripening and thick skinned, um, so you're going to get a lot of pigments out of there. And softer tannin, so we looked at Sangiovese and Nebbiolo. The Alianico, we'll be talking about tannins for sure. So this will be an interesting comparison. The multiple channel perhaps is a rounder, um, perhaps it is a sort of rounder wine, but we'll look at that in a little bit, but softer tannins and lower acidity. Wonderful acidity, but in terms of the scale, it's sort of a moderate uh, acidity. Okay, next. The, uh, the appellation, Montepulciano de Abruzzo DOC. Okay, it became a DOC right in the beginning. Um, the first one was in 1966 um, that we looked at um, the Bernace San Gimignano. Um, so uh, DOC 1968, it requires by law 85% um, Montepulciano. Our wine that we're tasting is 100%. Um, and if is the 15% can come from Sangiovese. Um, the dry medium body wine, the minimum requirement is 12.12% uh, 12 alcohol. I'm thinking of this because this 
today is 13 and a half percent. So there are a lot of sort of uh, regulations as we discussed with the DOCs and the DOCGs. Um, the colors, again, uh, high pigmentation. So it's gonna be a deep, rich, ruby red color. Um, oftentimes with violet reflections and it depends on the age, of course, because as we learned, um, as the wine ages, it loses color a little bit. And so if it's aged for many years, you start to see maybe more of an orange hue around the rim of the glass. This is a uh, younger wine. Perhaps we'll see some violet reflections when we do the wine tasting. Okay, so what are you gonna get in terms of aromas and flavors? Uh, a lot of red fruits, cherry, red plums. Think about where we are in Abruzzo. Um, uh, maturity of the grapes, a lot of sun, so a lot of sh great sugar development, maturity, and so the sugar converts to alcohol and fermentation. Um, so uh, you will get a lot of really good, rich, uh, fruity flavors, blackberries, prunes, very common is a spiciness. Uh, could be, these are just general, and it just depends on the wine and the winemaking process and the vinification process and everything else. So these are just some of the characteristics you can find. Hints of meat, uh, smokiness, um, again, because if it's aged in wood, you're going to get some of your tertiary um, um, aromas, uh, like coffee um, and the smokiness, okay? Subtle notes of violets and herbs and some uh, earthiness. Okay, next. Okay, here we are. So we're back to our wonderful producer, Tori de Biasi. Um, so that's right in their vineyard. And you can see the, um, the mountain peaks very close by. So um, what's important there in terms of, they're about like say 20 kilometers from the sea and just about the same to uh, Gran Sasso. Um, so basically that circulation of air. So during the day, there's also high altitudes. Okay, so during the day you get the warm uh, sea air coming over. And then at night you get a lot of the cold air coming off of the mountains. And so you get a continuous airflow. Why is that important? And why does that benefit the vineyards? So you think how hot it is there. Um, it helps with the um, keeping the vineyards healthy, away from disease. Um, it also promotes um, uh, good maturity and of the grapes. So it's just always a very a, important aspect. Okay, it affects your flavors and your texture. Okay, so here we are. This is their label, Torre de Biasi. Okay. All right, so what we'll be tasting today, we have uh, multiple chan, 100%, uh, vineyards, areas, 13 hectares. Again, so the altitude, uh, we know we like altitudes, vines like altitudes, 250 to 300 meters above sea level. Um, the, they're grown, uh, pergola uh, bucesen, uh, the soil, clay limestone. Uh, okay, so here the fermentation, is in steel tanks. The aging is a mix of uh, French oak barriques for about 15 to 18 months, um, as well as they do a mix uh, with uh, larger um, Slavo Slavonian uh, casks. So uh, they do use a mix. Uh, and they use the barriques that they use as the fourth passing. Um, so they're not brand new barriques. It's not that they buy used. It's because there's just different choices to make depending on the taste. We'll talk about that further if you have any questions. But um, they could use it, uh, the producers depending on what they're trying to achieve and depending on the strength of the uh, oakiness or the tertiary aromas, uh, you choose the type of wood, the size, et cetera, depending on where you want to go and what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so the alcohol, like I said, is 13 and a half percent, and the recommended serving temperature is 18 to 20 um, degrees. Okay, so uh, we could start, all right. 
Tony DiBiate, I just want to say, means uh, Tower of the Blessed. And it comes, that's the, that's the town um, uh, that's close to there. And that's uh, Fausto and Ana Maria, the owners. Um, that's an example of their vineyard. So the Tower of the Blessed, it comes from a detail of a 14th century fresco in the town of Loreto, which is near there, that's there. And basically the Torre de Biasi, uh, the Tower of the Blessed is, is um, on the judgment day where the, where the souls, the final goal where you wanna go, where the souls wanna go. And so there's this wonderful fresco in this church. So definitely worth a visit. Um, okay, so we have, it's a family run company. We have uh, Fausto and Ana Maria. They founded the company in 1999. Uh, Ana Maria's father, I think, had left them the, the land and they started to manually cultivate everything. This is an or organic. Both these companies are organic. Um, the first bottle dates back to uh, 2000. Um, and as I mentioned, they're located um, in Loreto a Putino. Um, and basically that whole area is very agriculture. It's still the main activity there. So you're basically between the mountains and the sea. Um, let's see, the, 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 what's very important to know is also that the vines here are this year 49 years old. Um, okay, so perhaps we can start uh, tasting the wine. So grab your glass. Okay, so first, We'll look at the, we'll take a look at the color. So as I said, there's a lot of anthocyanins and, and pigments. So you have a beautiful, uh, rich, uh, ruby red um, color, uh, dense, deep color, um, less transparent than the other ones we looked at before. Um, and if you give the glass a swirl, What do you see in terms of the legs? It's not a direct relationship by all means, but it, it's uh, an interesting thing to do. And it can give you an indication as, as to the complexity or the amount of extract. Um, so I could see that the legs are quite, uh, coming down the glass is quite slow, uh, lazy. Uh, this could be an indicator of some good complexity. Um, and also of a good uh, alcohol content. So again, what we're looking at here is just that it, it's just, just the, the, the viscosity or the density. Okay, so to the nose. So you want to take a nice sniff. Move away, swirl, get some oxygen in it. Hmm. Montepulciano has a wonderful nose. How are you liking it so far? Okay, so you're gonna get some nice ripe fruit. Um, so intensity, let's talk about intensity. It has a wonderful intensity. So intensity of your aromas, it's like what, going into a florist. You're not smelling the individual roses or the individual flowers. You're smelling the intensity of the perfume. So in this case, Montepulciano has is a wonderful intensity. Um, and in terms of then you break it down into the different families. Uh, first, there's always some fruit. Grapes are fruits. Some cherry, some dark cherry. Plum. I do get some spiciness, maybe a little bit of nutmeg. Um, I also get there uh, some some game or meat. I don't know if you can get that. Do you smell any of that? There's definitely, in terms of fruit, there's a sweeter 
uh, fruit aroma to it rather than acidic fruit. And a little bit of earthiness. Okay, so are you ready to taste? Beautiful. If you want, when you um, taste, you want to take in um, enough that you can swirl it around your mouth um, so that it gets to all the taste buds. Like normally when we're drinking and eating, uh, we don't take bigger um, slurps or tastes, but I do uh, recommend for the wine tasting to do so. Don't be embarrassed and swish it around your mouth. What do you think? This is a beautiful expression. It's lovely. Uh, it's round, it coats your mouth. Uh, it has a nice ting to it. I certainly get some red fruit. Um, um, let me see what else. Hi, Sandra. Sorry if I butt in. I just wanted to let you know that somebody commented in the chat that they taste black raspberry. Yes, almost like a raspberry compote. Um, very good, absolutely. Again, you get um, this in comparison, for example, if this was a Montepulciano without wood, um, it is Montepulciano, we are in the South, it is a rich grape. Um, so you're gonna get a lot of those deeper, richer, sweeter, sort of berry um, uh, aromas and flavors. Um, but yeah, definitely that's a good one. Anybody else? Uh, we just had a couple of comments that the wine is lovely and a thumbs up comment as well. The other important thing is back to sort of the, the past and about mass production. This is, this has nothing to do with that. And, and the beauty of this is that it's, um, it's specialized, it's authentic in the sense that you do get the roundness, but you also get a certain freshness. So if you think of what I was saying about the altitude, the mountains, um, the sea, the freshness, the acidity, it's, it's not a, you know, a super acid grape, but you do get a wonderful freshness from here. There's a wonderful acidity as well, which balances very nicely um, with the soft components of the wine. And that's always very important um, when we're evaluating wine is the overall balance. Um, the other important thing is, um, is the persistence, okay? So you, you can still keep tasting the wine. And that's a, a fine indicator of quality. Um, it's just a beautiful wine. Um, it pairs nicely with food. So what to pair it with here? Um, meats for sure. Um, um, lamb is a regional specialty in the area. Um, um, but also uh, speaking with Faso is full of power. They're wonderful people. And, and you could speak for hours with them. I mean, the passion, they wear it on their sleeve. And, and you know, he talked about uh, macaroni a la guitarra with tomato sauce and handmade meatballs. That's a typical abusese dish. So for all of the abusese out there. <laughs> um, so meat, pasta dishes with heavier sauces and meat. Um, it all goes really well. Um, beef. So let me take another sip. Of course, it's dry and it just coats your mouth so nicely and has a wonderful body. And it's just all around just such a beautiful wine. And it really does reflect the spirit and um, the passion of the territory and the winemaker. Um, Sandra, I just I want to ask you a quick question, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, in the aging process, could you explain the use of barriques with several passages? Uh, before we move on to the next one. Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, which uh, speaking of uh, Badik and the passages and using sort of um, uh, a used, the choice to use a, a combination between Badik and which is a 225, contains 225 liters. So there's a smaller ones to larger tasks. Um, what I also want to say is, this is a wonderful, uh, in terms of, um, it's, it's a great, um, what or how do you say, a great um, for your money, it's, you're getting a wonderful product. Um, to think that the, this is all done, it's organic. Uh, so much is done by hand. Um, and it spends 12, what is it, 12, 15 months of wood. Um, so that's an, that, that really says a lot about the wine. So in terms of the passing, I just wanted to say, so the decision that they use the new uh, Bariks for their crew, um, and then for the fourth passage, meaning they use, they use the used Bariks uh, for their aging because they don't want, they're not looking to have, because if you, the longer you use them, then the, the the effect of the oak is not as intense so that's very important that's the whole balance that these winemakers um work with so you want to have some of that complexity in with buddy with wood aging you have some micro oxidation happening you get some um you get a bit of tannins coming from the wood uh, but you get a lot of tertiary aromas and flavors but you don't want to kill the natural flavors and or overpower. And so that hence the choice of when to use used buddies or newer buddies. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Sandra. Okay. Any other comments about the wine? Uh, we had, uh, just the comments that the, the black raspberry and that it's beautiful and it tastes very lovely. The other thing I wanted to mention as we move on to the Lianico, which I don't know if I, I, I mentioned enough, is that the tannins, you do feel the uh, tannins, it's going to be, we're going to talk about tannins, with Deliana, you do feel the tannins and the tannins is a little bit the uh, astringency or the action that you feel in here or on your tongue, um, you do get that nice feel, but it's, they're softer and, and that's, they're fine. And that's, that's a difference between the characteristics of one wine to another. This is a rounder wine, um, but it's, it's a beautiful balance because the acidity is there. And as I said, acidity is important. It, has a, it adds complexity to a wine. Um, the tannins are there and you have this, a nice sugar and alcohol content. It's a refined, very refined multiple channel. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. I think we can keep some questions for the end, um, if we have any more, uh, just to give enough time to the Alianico as well. Yeah, for sure. Ah, and I did want to mention, um, we have a wonderful, <laughs> Because you're going to need some for the Alianico. Um, we have a wonderful antipasto plate for those of you who purchased one from Spacho Tironi's uh, production kitchen. So we have some uh, focaccia. We have some prosciutto crudo uh, di Parma, DOP. We have some uh, capocollo. We have grana uh, padano and pecorino toscano. Um, so, and, and the, uh, focaccia and some olives and artichokes, um, artichokes are, they, they're produced to quite a lot in these areas, by the way, both in Basilicata and Abruzzo, a lot of vegetable growing and agriculture. Um, so try some, enjoy, because when we get to the Yanico, you will definitely want to have some, like, capocollo. <laughs> okay. All right, let's get started. <clears throat>
Okay, so we're heading down <clears throat> south. We're in central Italy, Abruzzo. We're heading down south to Basilicata. Perhaps a lot of you are not even familiar with Basilicata. It doesn't really come up a lot, but it has been uh, mentioned more and more. The New York Times mentioned it a few years ago as a place to visit in 20, I don't know, 2018, or, or it was like number three. Um, so it is considered a little bit of a hidden secret. Um, so again, these are two territories that it's about uh, the beautiful landscape and wonderful wine. Okay, so we're going to explore the greatness of Alianico. Uh, again, Alianico is one of the most important varieties. I mean, once you, you know, we know if we talk about red varieties, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, and Alianico. Those are very, three very important varieties and perhaps uh, lesser known. Um, but by no means does that take away from its uh, power and its complexity. It's a fantastic and important variety. Okay, so we'll check it out. The Alianico, go ahead, we can move on to the next. Oh, okay, so if we consider Nebbiolo as the prince of Northern Italy and Sangiovese is the prince of uh, the center, central Italy. Well, Alianico is the prince of the South um, and is often referred to the Barolo of the South. So um, when you think of um, important, critically acclaimed wines, renowned Italian wines, what do you think of? Um, for sure, the three big B's, which we mentioned with the Barolo, Barbaresco, Brunello di Montalcino, Chianti Classico, uh, Sassicaia or Nellaia. Well, in that um, is Alianico and Alianico del Vutere. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. The, the the, 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 sorry, the Alianico is uh, the main three uh, wines are the DOC del Butere in Basilicata um, around Potenza, and we'll look at that, it, it needs to be 100%. Then you may have heard of or recognize or know uh, the Taurausi, which is another wonderful wine in Campania near Avellino, and then Tab Taburno, which is also in Campania. So we'll look at the map, but basically we're just south of Campania and these areas are actually not too far from each other. Um, so today we're going to look at um, one of these, uh, one of the best wines and that's uh, um, Alianico del Vue today. Okay, so um, again, it borders with Campania, Puglia, Calabria, um, and it's between all three coasts uh, has the um, Ionio, the uh, Tyrrhenian coast, and the Adriatic. Um, the ancient name was Lucania, as the instep of um, the boot of Italy. Um, the two main provinces and is Potenza and Matera. Matera, Potenza is where um, where Monte Vultere is, and we'll talk about that, uh, which um, which is the wine area that we're discussing. Uh, Matera is a, a UNESCO site. Uh, perhaps some of you are familiar with the Sassi di Matera, which is a, uh, it's a fabulous place. It's uh, their ancient cave dwellings. Um, and um, it's, um, in, it was named the European Capital of Culture in 2018. It's a UNESCO site. Um, the region is very mountainous, 47%. Uh, so mountains and, and landscape is very important for both of these regions. Mount Vultere, it's an extinct, extinct volcano, uh, 56 kilometers north of Potenza um, with a height of 1,326. So basically if you slice vertically more or less uh, the region from north to south, uh, the part that's connected to Puglia or the boot, that's the region of Matera. And to the west, you have Potenza, and the Mount Vultere is to the north. Okay. And there we have is a picture of, uh, of, the, of the extinct volcano, Mount Vultere. 
Um, it is the most significant winemaking region in Basilicata. Um, there is only one DOC in, uh, in Basilicata, and that's for the Superiore of this wine. Um, 2,400 hectares are cultivated. And what's important to know here is that we're talking about volcanic soils. This is um, a very uh, wonderful winemaking area. The wines are have a lot of personality and character. Um, and it is the big red grape of Southern Italy. Um, Aglianico is the only permitted grape and the heights are from 350 to 500 uh, meters above sea level. Okay, this is um, actually, here's a picture of Alianico, this is from our uh, Grifalco producers. So this is actually their, their vineyard. Um, so you can see a little bit the soil there. And we'll talk a little bit some of the red soils. And you can see it could be stony. Um, but the, 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 the ash, I mean, it was uh, thousands and thousands of years ago that the last eruption occurred. Like 140,000 years ago, and the first one was 700,000 years ago. So we're talking <laughs> uh, way back in the past. However, and so over time, the geology is all very complex in the soils. And so you get, depending on the parcels of land of the different vineyards, you get a real mix of soils. Okay, next. Then Yadiko. Again, we have another dark blue black uh, berry, thick skin. Uh, buds early and ripens late. Again, here we're going to be now the whole budding early and ripen, ripens late is very important because the maturity um, of the grape is so important. You want it to be ripe. You don't want to pick it too soon because if you pick it too soon, it's going to be bitter. So if this is a variety, which is that ripens actually very late, it's one of the maybe one of the, it ripens and harvests one of the latest in all of Italy. Um, it can go into November. Um, um, it's important because of the whole, it's starting to get colder, but you need those grapes to ripen. So you need the sunshine as it gets colder. Um, so there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. Um, buds early can be an issue because of frost. Um, so these are all um, important factors. It's low yielding. Uh, requires abundance of sunshine and dry climates. It thrives on volcanic soil. So here we are. It thrives on steep slopes and we're on very uh, steep slopes with our uh, producer, high altitudes. Now this uh, wine has strong tannins and high acid. So like I said, um, feel free to have some prosciutto and capocollo and a good piece of cheese. <laughs> Um, be before we do the wine tasting. Okay. The characteristics. Both these wines today, they're intense, deep ruby color, um, full body, uh, firm tannins, lots of tannins, minerality, high acidity, very rich aromas and flavors. This is a wine, like I said, that has a lot of character, a lot of personality. Um, it stands up from the crowd when, um, so and there's a lot of structure complexity and persistence. There's a lot of length on the palate and Alianico del Vultere is considered one of the most, or Alianico is, and the Vultere is considered one of the uh, most age worthy. Uh, so you could age this wine for a long time because remember to, to, to be able to age a wine for a long time, it needs to have a backbone, you need to have structure, you need to have complexity, complexity. otherwise you, you, you can't leave it there for years and years. That's why some wines uh, need to be, you need to drink them when they're young. They're meant to be drunk when they're young. Some other wines, you can buy a case of this and try one every year and see how it evolves. And that's why, so this right now, I think that this will be good in 10 plus years. Um, so keep that in mind when we uh, taste that. Okay, next. Grifaco. Um, so uh, like this is, uh, this is uh, the company that we're looking at. 
that we're presenting today. Okay, nice. Okay, the wine. Alianico del Buse de Dios, um, they're in the, um, the heart of the Buse de uh, Appalachian. Um, traditionally, historically, most of the producers are, are in the Venosa area, um, Mosquito, and then other areas, uh, Forenza. So they have plots of land in all those areas. It's 100% Alianico. And again, this is also a wonderful company that's organically certified. Uh, the vineyards age from 25, 40 years. Lots of altitude here, 450 to 550 uh, meters above sea level. So again, the diurnal uh, temperature difference between your day temperatures and your evening temperatures, um, that difference, that shift is uh, something that is favors uh, vine growing and wine making. Uh, the harvesting is manual, um, fermentation in sealed tanks, maceration on skins for about 10 days. Um, again here, second passing, the uh, French barrique, and they use the larger uh, tonneau for six to 12 months, um, and then aged in the bottle for six months. The alcohol content, uh, this one, this vintage is 13 and a half percent potential life of 10 years. And again, your reds are generally going to always be served that you want to serve them at, you know, roughly 16 to 18 degrees. Okay. Um, so basically, I just want to tell you a little bit about Tony De Biasi. Um, the company was um, founded in 2004 by Fabrizio and Cecilia Piccin, and they uh, had a winery in Montepulciano for about 20 years in Tuscany. So after they sold that, um, um, they fell in love with Basilicata. I think as they told me they had a friend in uh, Basilicata and fell in love with the territory. So I said, my goodness, uh, they really had quite the vision because this is in 2004. Um, so that area to have the vision to, to, to take, to, to uh, start a business. And um, it was, a, it was way ahead of his time. Um, so they moved to Basilica and started this new business. Um, they purchased 16 hectares of Alianico. There you could see uh, some of the red soils um, and that is, that's just a sign of um, a reflection of a higher uh, iron content in manganese, oxidated manganese. Um, so that adds some nice minerality perhaps to the wine. So the, today the business is run, we saw a picture of the two sons, um, Andrea and Lorenzo, and the two of them, they're wonderful. They handle every aspect of the business. Um, as they say, it's the two of us in the cellar. That's what they actually said. And they have a few, you know, somebody in the office and they have extra help during harvest and key times. But these are people who live and breathe uh, the business and the, um, the land and the vineyard. Um, they are certified organic. And I think uh, that covers it. So we'll uh, look at the, um, we're ready to try. Okay, so we look at the color, uh, very deep ruby red. So we know this is a very complex wine. You know, there are a lot of tannins, acidity. And if you look at the legs, they're very slow and lazy as well. Um, again, this doesn't mean anything in terms of whether it's a good or bad wine, but that does tell you that there's a lot of extract, there's some good alcohol, there's a lot of substance there. Okay, so to the nose. First, before stirring, just see what you can get. Swirl. Swirl. <laughs> the, 
Okay, so definitely we start right off with the fruits. I get certainly a lot of cherry, deep um, purple fruits, some prunes perhaps. I get some really nice minerality. Perhaps a bit of uh, pencil lead. And some smokiness. I do get some uh, ash, some smokiness. Any comments by from anybody? Uh, we had a couple of questions uh, in regards to the volcanic uh, area where the wine is produced, how that affects the wine, if you'd like to speak to that. Okay, so um, the volcanic ash, I think, even though this is like in many areas of Italy, um, actually in September, we'll be doing sort of, um, we'll be talking about a an active volcano in Sicily, but a lot of these are, are dormant or extinct. Um, but the ashes, if we, it's a very complex geology. And basically you think of the lava and the formations of the land and the landscape over the years, but basically there's a, 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 a lot of, um, there's an increase of minerals in the soil. And in this area, for example, um, there were also lakes um, in that area before it sort of all subtracted away and the lava and the soil over the years, um, you get a lot of complex uh, layers of soil, but basically um, they're generally also, they drain very well um, and that's good in terms of, um, of um, for the grapes, uh, for the vine growing, and basically oftentimes it, the, the grapes could be smaller um, and it, it can concentrate the flavors and the textures of the grapes. So a lot more common is a lot more minerality because of the minerals um, and just a, uh, usually a lot more intensity when it comes to flavors and texture. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. If you, uh, if you have the time, I'd like to ask you another question. Um, sure. Somebody said in the chat, let me just pull it up here quickly. Does the taste change if you leave it for up to 10 years? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, you know, that's something you need to, to we're talking about the Alianico del Vultere. Uh, this is a very uh, age worthy wine. And over the years, uh, I do recommend really, if you try one year after year, you could see the changes that happens with the aromas and flavors over time. Um, we can't tell you what they're going to be, but you, they will become more and more complex. Um, the fruit flavors will more mature. You'll probably get even rounder tannins. Uh, for sure, because over time it becomes rounder and softer. Um, it's a beautiful wine. It's a very, it's one of the most important in Italy. Um, it's just not recognized as much. And so basically, truly in terms of value and quality. Um, and again, what's important overall really is the style of wine that you prefer. Because uh, one wine could be very tannic, another one will be very rounder, what have you, white, red. The most important thing is the education and trying and just finding, you know, the type of varieties that you prefer and the style that you prefer. Not all wines are for all, for everybody. And that's to me, the most important thing. There's a wine for everybody. Um, if you like, I mean, if you want to drink wine, like wine, but um, so yes, the, 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 the flavors and intensity will become even richer, rounder um, and deeper. And I'd like to ask one more question before mm -hmm. um, we finish uh, for tonight and pass uh, the word to Tiziana. We just to do, we do the tasting. Oh, yeah, yes, right, Sandra, but I'll, I'll just 
I'll ask you the last question and then I'll let you finish uh, before okay. Tiziana comes on. Um, uh, so would the wine benefit or would these wines benefit from decanting? Uh, that's a really good question. That's a really good, the reason why, is because there's always a lot of debate about decanting. Um, and so everyone has a very different view on it. And um, definitely some wines, we're going to taste this, but, um, you know, I, I straight out asked the, the Fratelli <laughs> Grifalco Pichi, <laughs> um, just because there's a bit of a different of, uh, views on this. And they said, oh, no, just open the bottle. It's meant to be, it should drink the way it is. Um, but um, it won't hurt to also decant for about, open it up for a half hour. This is the kind of wine that you do want to open up if you can a half hour to an hour earlier because it is the tannins. It's a young wine, but this, this wine is going to travel. So um, um, the multiple channel, it's ready to go. Um, and it will change over the years, but it will, after a few years, it's not going to change as much. This is really at the beginning of its cycle of the curve. So decanting, I'm not spinning around just because, because there are different views. Um, a wine like this, it won't hurt to open it up a bit early and decant or just open up the wine for sure to get a bit of air in it because it is a tighter wine. Do we want to try the, uh, definitely want to try the taste? I'm sure a lot of you guys, I hope. You've already uh, tasted it. This is, it's wonderful. Um, this is a wine that has character. It's, um, the, the most important thing with uh, Grifalco and their wine is that Agnianico, Agnianico del Butere, has a, a bit of a, a reputation because it can be very powerful and very excessive. However, it doesn't have to be, and that's what's important. Um, they wanted to, uh, as they said, uh, uh, an expression that's honesto, and I love that word, that, uh, honest and authentic. So it's exceptional, but it doesn't have to overpower. Um, here you have, what do you have? You taste the tannins. You taste them. Now, I think this already, I've tried it when I just opened the bottle and I felt those tannins a little bit more. It's been open for a while. Um, it's been breathing. And I have to say, it's a wonderful balance. I These are tannins. It's like the Nebbiolo San Giovese, same kind of thing. The tannins, you feel them here. You feel the astringency. It's a bit of... Um, they say a little bit like sandpaper on your tongue. Um, you can taste it. Can you feel that sense of the astringency on your tongue? So it's a little bit like um, tannins are also found in tea, for example, or um, uh, parsimons. Uh, if you, you know when you taste the skin, the khaki in Italian, um, and it leaves that taste in your mouth, but that's that's the same kind of feeling. Um, so I don't know, you could taste some good spiciness, some nice mature fruit. Um, and the great thing is that there's a lot of, um, there's a nice persistence. It's a wonderful balance uh, between the, um, the acidity and everything else. So I don't, I know, I think we're time. Uh, I just want to see, want to see if there's any other, if there are any other questions. Um, oh, I think there were a lot of great comments, uh, Sandra, with uh, the regards to flavors and aromas of this wine. I think I uh, hope you enjoyed, you really enjoyed it. it. They're, two, they're two wonderful expressions. I mean, you, yes. um, if you're, you know, they can be purchased uh, through Camino, but apart from that, it's just really the the great thing about these, I can multiple channel the boots of the wine. The name, the DOC, maybe is a little bit more known, but the areas and sort of this level of wine making, um, and they're both uh, just one great values for the wines. Great values. So, anyways, the right. quality is exceptional, and they reflect the the land and the territory, and that's what's most important. So, 
I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, well, we are enjoy very, the wine. Actually, a lot of uh, good comments are coming in saying thank you. Uh, everybody enjoyed boy, both wines. Um, and uh, uh, somebody saying I could listen to you talk for hours. So great. So oh, wow. again, so that's, thank you thank so you much, Sandra. <laughs> Yes. Listen, it's been a pleasure for me and the and and a source of uh, like I said inspiration and it's a passion and just to uh, you know distract from other things that we won't mention. But so um, um, thank we'll you. See you soon. Stay yes. well. We'll see you all soon. Well, we'll see you again soon for the thank you uh, little segment on the Friuli events and then yes. again on uh, June twenty fourth. Uh, so thank you again, and thank you, Kavinona, for this great presentation. And uh, thank you, everybody who has uh, been following us uh, for these classes and for the True Italian Taste program. And uh, from Eco Canada, and Corrado Paina, our executive director, Astrid, Ilaria, Monica, and of course myself. Um, see you soon for our upcoming events. Uh, cheers and grazie. Cheers. Grazie. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Evening, a presto, everybody. A presto. <laughs> Thank presto. you, Anna, and everybody at Camerona. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Buona serata.